Salutations! Today's video is about a topic that I'm quite passionate about. Battlefield is one of my favorite first-person shooter franchises, and the titles that are being targeted by EA and DICE to be sunsetted this year are among my favorite entries in the franchise. These include Battlefield 1943 and both Bad Company titles. As of this video's posting, these games have been delisted from online stores, and this December, the servers will go offline. For the Bad Company titles, the only way you'll be able to get them now is through physical copies. Sadly, 1943 is no longer available, legally, as it was a digital-only release on the 7th gen consoles. For this video, I'll be reminiscing the fond memories that I've had with these titles. Assuming we'll still be able to access the multiplayer menus for these titles when the servers are shut down, I'll list what you could potentially still do with these games in an online setting. With all that said, let's begin. Battlefield Bad Company was my first entry into the Battlefield series. I played the beta and the demo. I grinded the multiplayer, got as many of the Find All 5 weapons as I could, and thoroughly enjoyed the campaign. This game also had some of the best marketing I've ever seen. So you reckon that the rainbow sprinkles are the way forward with the donut? Absolutely, because then you get the different textures between Shh. soft donut and Could you do get your ass over here right now? See? Did you see that? What? Why would he do that? That's as stupid as hiding in a cardboard box. Well, well, what do we do? I mean, maybe it's some kind of special military barrel, you know? Like some kind of real solid metal. It's no secret as to what this game's main hook is, the destruction. The entire game's sandbox revolves around this concept. Each class has a way to cause some level of destruction. The assault rifles have grenade launchers, demolition has RPGs, Recon has a laser designator, the specialists have C4, and support calls in artillery strikes. We can't forget the myriad of vehicles that can cause destruction too. This is what got me hooked into Battlefield as a kid. Granted, Bad Company's level of destruction isn't as complex as Red Faction Guerrilla's, but what we have available in a 2008 FPS title that looks this good while including the destruction, it's more than enough for me. The Frostbite engine was something else during this era. The game's campaign is just funny. I know many people point to the game's main cast of characters when they think back to Bad Company's charm, and they're still right, but I mean, just look at this combat loop. When playing campaign or as the assault class in multiplayer, most of your time will be spent stabbing yourself with the auto-injector like you're some truckie. Difficulty in the campaign is a myth. You have this life stick on you, and instead of reverting to an earlier checkpoint after dying, you respawn. The battle you were just in continues from where you left off. The level designers for this game also had a real affinity for placing a ton of explosives in highly convenient locations. But you know what? As flawed as the campaign was, it served its purpose. It's effectively a tech demo with a story, and in my opinion, that's not a bad thing at all. You can blow up as many walls as possible while listening to a bunch of idiots that, to this day, are some of my favorite characters in all of gaming. Seriously, if it weren't for Preston, Haggard, Sweetwater, and Redford, the campaign would be much worse off. They carried this game on their backs just as much as the destruction did. You lost them, you imbecile! Now I know what I'm doing. This is a shortcut. You know what you do. You know what you do. If I had a penny for every time you said that, I wouldn't be needing this gold. We have come to bring you in. Bring you in. Just you. Just us. <laughs> Four puny military. Four puny military. Damn it, Haggard. There's gold in them little hills. Shh. That's a neutral zone. Haggard, fall back. He can't hear you, Sarge. The multiplayer front is a much different story, at least nowadays. I remember having a ton of fun with Bad Company's multiplayer, even preferring it over Call of Duty 4's for a time. I can't say that anymore though, and I'll explain why. The game's population is nowhere near as high as it was back in the day, which is understandable considering the game's age, and just simply being outcompeted by other FPS's, especially COD, but also Bad Company 2, which I'll talk about later. I feel the reason for this low population stems from the following issues. 
A defending team that's significantly better than the attackers can and will push up to the attacker's spawn area and camp their spawns. No one wants to sit through that, and I hate it just as much when my own team does it. Friendly fire is also on at all times in multiplayer. This would change in future titles when hardcore mode would be introduced, with regular mode turning friendly fire off. The biggest issue I have with this game is the hit registration. It doesn't help that many of the automatic weapons in this game dish out very low damage per shot, especially the SMGs. Speaking of SMGs, you can't aim down the iron sights with them in this game. Same with the shotguns, but you wouldn't really want to anyway. Only assault rifles and light machine guns give you the ability to ADS, and I can't see that being a turnoff for players. There are no attachments for weapons in this game either, and after Call of Duty 4 made this a staple in modern military FPS games, Bad Company felt like it was behind the times in this regard. I don't mind the exclusion of attachments here since the iron sights are well designed and offer clear sight pictures, but for players that like to customize their weapons, there's nothing here. Lastly, I feel the class system is a bit simplistic and restricting for many people. Not every class includes a pistol, which is exclusive to recon. Grenades are also exclusive to the Assault, Demolition, and Specialist classes. These restrictions make your role on the battlefield much less versatile than in other games. If you pick Demolition, for instance, you'll only have a shotgun as a primary, with your only other ranged options being RPGs and grenades. Going up against anyone using an assault rifle is much harder without a backup pistol. Going back to the campaign for a few moments, this class setup is in the single player too. Picking up a weapon is akin to picking up a part of a multiplayer class. If you find a sniper rifle, it comes with a pistol. Shotguns, SMGs, and light machine guns come with grenades. Finally, all the assault rifles have grenade launchers, which overrides your ability to carry grenades. You're also only able to carry one gadget, but it could be any you want, so you can hold a sniper rifle and have an RPG, for example. Back to the multiplayer, while I have been ragging on it, it could still be fun when all of the stars align. If there's a good connection, no griefing teammates, and a healthy amount of players on each team, I can guarantee you this is a fun multiplayer experience. My opinion on it might have soured over the years, but I don't hate it, and it has a ton of charm. Gold Rush is such an amazing mode, and I love the gold bars that appear after detonating the crates, which sadly became absent in Bad Company 2 and onwards. I especially love the voice lines. Grease monkey! This thing's falling apart! Riley's over here! Come on! Yes! The gold is mine! I, I mean ours! Great job, guys! I should also let you know that Bad Company has a conquest mode. Nobody plays it because you had to manually download the mode from the game store when it was still available. Why they didn't just add the mode naturally like any other update, I don't know. I mentioned the Find All 5 program earlier. This was an event back in the day that awarded players with exclusive weapons for achieving certain tasks outside of the game. These included the F-2000, for players who have played another Battlefield game, the USAS-12, which is obtained for checking your stats on Pad Company's website, the M-60, for those who signed up for the Battlefield newsletter, the QBU-88, which was a pre-order bonus, and the Uzi for players who reached rank 4 in the Bad Company demo. DICE eventually made them more easily obtainable by releasing codes that you can enter in the menu, and I'll put these codes on screen right now. However, the F-2000 was sadly exempt. To this day, you still need to achieve veteran status, which is now impossible because the feature doesn't work anymore. I bet more than 90% of players have never used this weapon before, and I hardly ever run into it online. My old Xbox Live account had this weapon, but it got hacked in 2010 and I completely forgot about it. I feel EA and DICE should just make a code for the F-2000 as Bad Company Sunset draws near, or at least fix the veterancy check. Players should be able to use this weapon in this game before they just can't anymore. Speaking of the Sunset, Let's talk about what you'll be able to play in Bad Company when the servers go down. There's Campaign... And that's it. Nothing else. The multiplayer for this game was limited to EA-hosted servers, with no way to make private matches on your own. When the servers go down, the multiplayer in its entirety will go down with it. 
rendering Bad Company a single-player only game. Battlefield 1943 is my personal favorite of these three. It runs on Frostbite 1.5, an upgraded rendition of the engine Bad Company used. Releasing for only 15 US dollars in 2009, this is in contention for being one of the greatest arcade titles of all time, and I have to agree. For what's available in 1943, it's well worth the price. Four large maps with a nice assortment of weapons, vehicles, and equipment at the player's disposal. Plus, 1943 looks amazing for a 2009 title that only costs a quarter of a regular game. There's no single player campaign, but that's okay as all of the resources that went into this game were allocated into one of my favorite multiplayer experiences of all time. 1943 is a simplified World War II skin for Bad Company, and that's what allows the gameplay to be as great as it is. The destructible environment mechanics from Bad Company were brought over to 1943 allowing this game to be the most environmentally dynamic World War II FPS the world had seen up until this point. Weapon selection is limited, with specific weapons tied to each of the three classes, which include the riflemen, the engineers, and the scouts. With the simplified nature of this game, there are no med packs or ammo boxes to throw down. Everyone has regenerating health and unlimited ammo, with the latter coming with a cooldown timer for explosives like rockets and grenades. There's a good selection of vehicles as well, with jeeps, tanks, boats, emplacements, and fighter-bomber planes all being accessible, as well as the air raid bunker that calls in three bombers which you can control. If there's a word that I can describe this game, it's charming. Unlike the first Bad Company where the overall color palette was tan, brown, and orange, 1943's has a much wider variety in colors, with light blue skies and oceans, as well as lush green vegetation. The game itself is oozing with style. You get these stamps by accomplishing certain tasks, and at the end of each game, there's a speech that sounds like it's pulled from the 1940s. The coral beaches of Wake Atoll are now the perfect base for US Marines to continue their advance towards the Japanese homeland. The Imperial Japanese Force... I mentioned that 1943 has four maps, but only three of them are a part of the standard gameplay. These include Guadalcanal, Iwo Jima, and the iconic Wake Island. These three maps are played with a tried and true conquest mode. The fourth map is Coral Sea, and it's exclusive to 1943's second game mode, Air Superiority. Air Superiority is conquest but with one flag. Whichever team controls this point gains Air Superiority, and the other team's spawn tickets will start to deplete. This was unlocked after the player base reached 43 million kills after the game launched. Since 1943 doesn't have a campaign mode, what will you be able to do with this game once a shutdown happens? Well, there's private matches that players can host, but there's a massive catch. You need 16 players minimum for a game to start. This is a hard limit that can't be changed, and it's absolutely ridiculous. The only way for something like this to happen is with a massive amount of pre-planning with Discord servers. Thankfully, there is a Battlefield 1943 Discord server by Bryant DL7, the founder of Darkstorm servers, as well as this community of Battlefield 1943 fans. I'll also link their website, bf1943.org, which has daily air superiority events for this game posted on their events tab. While I'd rather see this game not have the main DICE hosted servers go down, as well as seeing the game relisted online, I'm glad that there will still be a way to play this game at all. What can I say about Battlefield Bad Company 2 that hasn't been said already? It's in contention for being one of the most beloved Battlefield titles of all time, having one of the best multiplayer components in the series. Like with Bad Company 1, I personally played both the beta and demo versions of the game when each launched. I have specific memories of using the M24 sniper rifle on Arica Harbor and trying to go for the highest marksman headshot bonuses I could get. A lot of the issues that were present in Bad Company 1 have been addressed in Bad Company 2. The overall time to kill in Bad Company 2 has been significantly shortened compared to its predecessor. This is an especially welcome change for the submachine guns which can also utilize iron sights for much better accuracy than in the previous game. 
Hit detection overall feels much better, and there's no more friendly fire in standard play, only in the newly added hardcore game modes. Speaking of game modes, Conquest is now a natural part of the game, unlike in Bad Company 1 when it was DLC. Destruction was upgraded in this game too. Certain buildings can now collapse when all of its walls have been destroyed. Utilizing this mechanic is imperative in Rush. Some MCOM stations are placed in these destructible buildings, and having the building collapse on the MCOM will immediately destroy it. The class system got a major overhaul after Bat Company 1, and this setup would set the precedent for Battlefield's classes in all future titles. All classes now have access to sidearms and frag grenades, but there's much more to it. There's a new perk system called the Specializations that give your weapons, vehicles, gadgets, and even your player character various upgrades. Some of these perks include reducing weapon spread, increasing weapon damage, giving you more starting ammo, a secondary fire option for vehicles, and even weapon attachments, including a red dot sight and a 4 times rifle scope. You can even give these sights to your sniper rifles. I remember having my mind blown after realizing I could put a red dot sight on one of the bolt action rifles. The slug rounds for the shotguns are probably my favorite though. They turn the shotguns into bootleg sniper rifles, and it's funny using them to counter snipe other snipers. Speaking of sniping, I mentioned the marksman headshot bonus. It's a new way to achieve bonus XP by getting sniper headshots as far away from your target as possible. Thing is, Bad Company 2 introduced bullet drop for all of the standard weapons, including the sniper rifles. In the previous titles, snipers only needed to account for distance, not elevation. So you can simply line up your reticle on someone's head from any range and the bullet will eventually hit its mark. This changed with Bad Company 2, with elevation now being a factor alongside distance. This allows the range finders and the scopes to finally serve a purpose, helping you line up that accurate shot from much further out. Like with Bad Company 1, Bad Company 2 also had DLC. The first was Onslaught, a cooperative PvE mode where up to four players take control of points against Russian soldiers. There was also the Spect Act group of camouflaged weapons and character models. Finally, the most noteworthy DLC pack was Bad Company 2 Vietnam. It's similar to Battlefield 1943 in many aspects, being a multiplayer expansion in a historical setting, utilizing the base game's gameplay mechanics. It features a wide variety of Vietnam-era weaponry including the M16A1, the AK-47, the M14, and a whole lot more, along with vehicles including tanks, jeeps, boats, and the iconic Huey helicopter. Unlike 1943, however, Vietnam is integrated into Bad Company 2 itself and is not a standalone game. I personally prefer Vietnam's gameplay to the actual Bad Company 2 experience. Not to say Bad Company 2 is bad, because it's absolutely not, I just really like how balanced Vietnam is, as well as the overall style. The Hueys even have radios in them, and you can blare right of the Valkyries as you decimate your enemies. It's just so badass. I've been showing the Xbox 360 version of this game as that was the version I spent the most time on back in the day, but there's perhaps the biggest change that I haven't mentioned yet. Bad Company 2 has a PC version, which is a first for this collection of three Battlefield games. Battlefield itself has primarily been a PC-centric franchise ever since the first title, Battlefield 1942. Starting with Battlefield 2 Modern Combat, however, DICE started to dip into the console market, with Modern Combat, Bad Company 1, and 1943 being console exclusive. Bad Company 2 was the first mainline Battlefield title since 2142 to have a PC release at all, and the PC version has many noticeable upgrades compared to the console versions. Higher resolutions, unlocked frame rates, adjustable field of view settings, a higher player count with 32 players maximum compared to consoles 24, and user-made dedicated servers with various rules that you can implement. For example, you can have it so players are punished for spawn killing near the home base, and it's something I really wish was a thing in the previous two Battlefield games. Bad Company 2 also has an active modding community on PC. Some of my favorite client-side mods include filter removers, an increased draw distance mod, and a vehicle HUD overhaul that makes visibility much better. I'll link the Battlefield modding Discord server in the description, you should check it out. One more aspect about the game I'd like to talk about is the campaign itself. Despite the first game's campaign being flawed, I still enjoyed it and its campy attitude. Unfortunately, 
that wasn't translated nearly as much in Bad Company 2. I don't remember enjoying this game's campaign all that much when it came out, and revisiting it all but confirmed my lack of care for it. The story feels a lot more serious now, and not in a good way. Granted, there's still funny moments here and there, but the overall vibe just isn't the same. There aren't any misfit soldiers on a quest for mercenary gold anymore. Just four people doing what the army tells them to do in a generic military FPS campaign story. It's almost as if the first game never even happened. We don't know what happened with all of that gold they were running away with at the end of the first game, and there's no mention of the Legionnaire who survived the final battle. The characters mostly behave like they did in the previous game, with the exception of one, Haggard. He seems a lot more jaded than he was in Bad Company 1. I mean, I would be too if I still had to work for the army after getting all that gold, but we don't see this happen. Why is he this upset all the time? Being downright mean to Sweetwater in some instances. He poked fun at him all the time in the first game, but it seemed like in jest. Here it feels downright spiteful, and it left me feeling awkward. Thanks. Thanks, Hags. Look, I wasn't raised in a suburb, you frickin' moron. It feels like Haggard's role as the funny and stupid one is replaced by a new character, Flynn. He's your helicopter pilot in this campaign and is a hippie stoner. I enjoyed his screen time, and seeing him was a sigh of relief after all the melodrama. Come on, dude! Oh, shit, man, you just hang on, man. I just I lost my smoke, so I, hang on a minute. Fuck Tuesdays, man. I'm gonna get my shit together on a Tuesday. When are we gonna get there? Couple of minutes. Get on those mini guns and start firing. Ain't you gonna help us, Flynn? What me? No way, man. I'm a pacifist. What? Pacifist? How can you be a goddamn pacifist? Yeah, it's bad for my karma, man. Don't mess with karma. I just fly. Hags, let it go. Fuck that. Now don't fly with me, Space Muffin. I'm gonna argue you to the goddamn Magic Kingdom. Love you, man. Besides the tone being different and not for the better, level design is also a lot more restrictive in this entry. Missions are a lot more linear than they were in Bat Company 1, and were overall not that memorable. There's also way too many on-rail sections for my liking. Whenever I'm forced onto a turret or a minigun without having any other options, I just feel upset. The first game was very light on this, and there were a number of turret segments where being on the turret itself was never a requirement. One mission that did feel close to the original's levels was the desert mission, Sangre del Toro. It's a vast expanse of sand that gives you the ability to tackle each of the three objectives in any order that you want. Another noteworthy level is actually the first one, Operation Aurora. It takes place during World War II in the Pacific Theater, and it looks downright gorgeous at times, even on console. Other than those levels, everything else just felt bland in comparison. Despite the criticisms, there were quality of life improvements to the gameplay itself. Just like in multiplayer, Enemies don't take forever to kill with automatics anymore, and you can carry more than one primary weapon, with weapons no longer adhering to that pseudo-class system Bad Company 1 used. This means you'll always have access to grenades as well. There are also supply drops scattered throughout the campaign that allows you to change your loadout, giving you the right tools for the given situation. It's a shame, because all of these positive changes could have made a Bad Company 1 style of campaign so much better, but that's not what we got. Instead, we got a generic FPS campaign that ends on yet another cliffhanger that will likely never be resolved. Alright, so after all that, what will we be able to do with Bad Company 2 once a server shutdown happens? Well, I have a lot of good news. Like with Bad Company 1, you'll still have the campaign to play, and just like 1943, the console version still has private matches with a much more lenient minimum player count, only requiring 8 players compared to 16. The console version also has private Onslaught matches that you can host. The PC version of Bad Company 2 was going to have Onslaught, as well as a PC port of 1943, but DICE reallocated all their development assets to completing Battlefield 3, leaving Onslaught and 1943 to remain console exclusive. So what does this mean for the PC version? It doesn't have Onslaught or private matches, and the servers are going to shut down. This seems like a repeat of Bad Company 1 situation where only the campaign will be playable. Thankfully, multiplayer will live on. Dennis Unleashed has Project Rome, a modding platform for the game that has its own master server. I'll leave all the important links about it in the description, 
but all you need to do is sign up on the Venice Unleashed website, download the Project Rome client, place the DLL into your Bad Company 2 directory, and log in with their new Venice Unleashed account. You'll have access to their servers, and you'll still be able to play the game's multiplayer long after the shutdown. Before we wrap up this video, I just want to say how stupid all this is. There's no reason for EA and DICE to shut these games down. If it's so costly to maintain the servers, they should just release the master server assets to the community and let us continue to run these games. This is especially bad for 1943. There's no way to legally obtain this game anymore, and such an amazing game doesn't deserve this kind of death. None of these games do, but at least with the bad company games, you can buy used physical copies. You can't with 1943. I see no reason to delist them where they can easily still be online. Please change your minds, EA. This is not the way to go at all. They're trying to push the portal mode for 2042 as like a replacement for Bad Company 2, and I'd played it recently and it's just not the same. It's really just 2042 with a Bad Company 2 skin. It's just not a replacement for it. I want to play Bad Company 2 itself. Keep that game alive. And that's going to be it for this video. If, and only if, you found the information about this video useful, hit the like button, subscribe for more analytical gaming content from this channel, and hit the bell to never miss an upload. Also leave a comment about your fondest memories with these games. I'd like to thank my counselors from Patreon. Thank you to Saving Private Mike, Blake Volant, Evan Tripp, Punk Anderson, Alec Hash, Michael Johnson, Tom Bax, Basic Toast, Ghost, Scatman, UNSC Shooter, C3 Sabretooth, The Cave Potato, Just Larm, Turbo Simp, Synonymous Hooligan, Sean T, Conor Daytona, Rad Mayan, Kyle Dealman, Ghost Slayer, and Tommy Slav. This is the Vengeful Vatum. Always remember that you matter more than you think you do, and I'll see you on the Great Journey. Save 1943, save bad company.